Um, thank you all so much for coming out today, tonight. Uh, my name is Mara Carlin, and I'm an Associate Professor and Associate Director of Strategic Studies, and also Executive Director of the Merrill Center for Strategic Studies. Really excited uh, to have two just terrific individuals with us today uh, to talk about what's happening in UK defense. Let me uh, briefly introduce them first. So we have Permanent Secretary Stephen Lovegrove, who became the Permanent Secretary just about a year and a half ago. Um, after that, he, excuse me, preceding that, he was the Permanent Secretary for the Department of Energy and Climate Change. He's had a really interesting, diverse background over the years, working um, in a di bunch of different capacities, um, shareholder executive, Deutsche Bank, um, strategic consulting, European media, um, and now he gets to think all sorts of thoughts about where the UK's Ministry of Defense is and where it should go. And he does that hand in hand with the Vice Chief of the Defense Staff, General Sir Gordon Messenger. Um, and, uh, and General Sir Gordon Messenger is a Marine, of course, joined the Roy Royal Marines uh, a couple decades ago and has had a number of assignments um, really around the world from Kosovo to Afghanistan. He attended the Canadian Staff College. He's worked at Joint Force Headquarters. He's spent time in, um, in Lebanon in just a number of different places. Um, and then, of course, uh, across the UK. Um, he, he, in his role now, he works hand in hand with the Permanent Secretary also to figure out where is the UK on defense issues and where is it going. So having the two of them here is just a real treat um, as they are in the throes of a big visit to Washington. So I'll, uh, I'll open up with a handful of questions to them about why they're here, what they're doing here. Uh, and then I'll turn the floor over to you all. We'll have someone come around with a microphone. Let me note that this event is, is webcast and then, of course, uh, on the record. Um, so please feel free to, uh, to, to write it down. Any deep thoughts should be cited accordingly in your papers, of course. Of course. So, uh, so, so let, let me um, start out, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. General Messenger, tell us a little bit about what is the UK military doing these days? Okay, well, thank you. Um, um, so firstly, uh, thank you for giving us um, uh, the floor. It's a really sort of respected uh, institution. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to come to America and uh, just lay out um, a little about uh, what the UK military is doing at home and on the world stage, um, which I'll set out. Uh, and then uh, Stephen will talk a, a little about the uh, modern, uh, modernizing defense uh, program that is underway, which is really uh, our attempt to ensure that we are appropriately configured for future and emerging threats, um, given the pace at which technology uh, and threats are, are changing. The reason why um, uh, I think we're pleased uh, to um, have this platform is because there are some misconceptions uh, out there um, about uh, the uh, UK uh, military output. And if you were uh, to read um, every uh, 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 press article, uh, you could be forgiven uh, for thinking uh, that the UK military was in some form of uh, decline, uh, lacking uh, confidence and not delivering the outputs that the world has come to expect of it. Um, I uh, do not share that characterization. Um, I am not suggesting that the UK defence community doesn't have uh, certain challenges, but I think those are challenges that are shared by every uh, military and every defence community uh, around the world. And, and indeed, I think we as a, a, a nation should be very proud of defence's outputs, um, both in support of our own national security interests, but also in uh, support of uh, global uh, stability. When you look at what we are trying to deliver as a medium power with a medium defence budget, it is almost unique. Um, we are, of course, a nuclear power. Uh, we uh, deliver a 24-7 continuous at-sea uh, deterrent with the high levels of investment uh, and uh, sophisticated capabilities that go along with delivering that capability and protecting that capability. 
Uh, we are determined to be and to remain a high-end player, uh, able to operate on uh, day one uh, in the most contested, challenging military environments, in uh, degraded uh, 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 operational contexts against peer, near-peer uh, adversary, adversaries with high-end capability arranged against us. That requires us to be at the top table in terms of uh, technology, keeping abreast of changes. It needs us to be interoperable with uh, our equally capable allies, of course, uh, the US first and foremost uh, amongst them. And again, that um, is a challenging uh, uh, ambition, but it's one that we are determined to, uh, to maintain. We're also determined to continue to play our part as a global player. As uh, a United Nations Permanent Five member, uh, we think it is our duty uh, to uh, play our part in uh, tackling global uh, instability. And when you look at where we are around the world at the moment, the numbers that we have deployed are actually down from the high points of the sort of Afghanistan and, and Iraq campaigns. But the number of different missions that we are on uh, has increased significantly. So we have about uh, five to 6,000 personnel deployed uh, overseas, uh, but they're engaged on uh, uh, well over 20 uh, missions uh, in well over uh, 20 uh, countries, uh, operating in a variety of different uh, organizational contexts and with a vast array of, 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 of the different natures of, of, of those operations. So we're a major contributor to NATO uh, through the enhanced forward presence to the very high readiness task force, through the air policing that we conduct annually, through our leadership of the various uh, standing maritime uh, groups that NATO um, uh, deliver. Uh, we continue to uh, play a prominent role with multiple hundreds uh, of uh, our people in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we um, uh, are upping our contribution to the United Nations, principally uh, through um, uh, our commitment to uh, South Sudan and the United Nations mission there. We are, uh, by some distance, the second biggest contributor to the counter Daesh uh, effort in um, Syria uh, and uh, Iraq. Uh, and more recently, we've demonstrated uh, our intention to uh, r remain involved and engaged in some of the security challenges uh, in the Far East by committing uh, a number of maritime uh, deployments to that region uh, in support of the, uh, the international effort there. So that's a, that's a significant global footprint. And as I say, um, they're not inconsequential deployments. There's a number of them there that are in the multiple hundreds. And the sheer variety of what we're asking our people to do uh, does remain um, a challenge. So General Messenger, I think what we're hearing from you is that the UK military is all over the place doing all sorts of things. But it seems pretty recent that you and I were working on the SDSR, right? Only about two and a half years ago that the UK was doing its big strategic review. Uh, so why are we sitting here today? Permanent Secretary Lovegrove, can you help us understand what, what's, what's been happening? Um, yes, with pleasure. Um, the SDSR uh, 15 is not something that we're disavowing at all. It set out three, uh, sorry, it set out four big threats at the beginning of it, uh, which uh, we continue to believe are the things that are defining the age, and they are the resurgence of state-based threats, the evolution of violent extremism, uh, the rapid uh, development of technology, and the uh, undermining of rules, the rules-based international uh, order. And those four themes are still very much uh, current. They are very much in the national defense strategy of the US. Um, and, you know, we are, th those are the guiding uh, points by which we are navigating. What has happened, however, in the last two years um, has been that at least three of those, and arguably the fourth, have got worse and more complicated. And the three which have definitely got worse and more complicated are state threats, technology uh, development and the erosion of the rules-based international order. And I think nobody assumed that violent extremism was going to go away anytime soon. It hasn't gone anywhere away anytime soon. 
but it, it, it hasn't got noticeably worse than anybody uh, expected at the moment. Um, as well as those um, threats, by and large, getting worse, they have become more complicated. So there has been a very unwelcome degree of cross-contamination between them. So you are seeing um, very sophisticated weaponry in the hands of um, very, um, uh, 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 very unfamiliar hands. Um, and you are seeing uh, very large states uh, doing things which they hope to find, which they hope will be deniable, which are going to be difficult to attribute. Of which, the most noticeable and startling ver uh, example of which was in Salisbury a couple of weeks ago in the UK, with the use of um, <coughs> a military-grade nerve agent um, by the Russian Federation on the soil of the United Kingdom, which is a truly extraordinary thing to say. And I don't think anybody would have felt um, was very likely that anybody was going to be saying a couple of years ago. So we, we've seen that getting worse. Um, we had a process at the um, a second half of last year called the National Security Capability Review. There were 12 strands to that. In fact, actually, the results of basically 11 of those strands have been published today. Um, one of those strands was defence. Um, throughout the NSCR, I think the realisation um, became clearer and clearer that um, defence had some very, very profound uh, things to deal with as a result of the developments over the last couple of years. And the Prime Minister, the Chancellor and Secretary of State for Defence in the UK decided that we needed a few more months, frankly, to be able to deal um, w with that. Um, so we've now gone into a modernising defence programme. Um, it's very similar, actually, to many of the themes that um, we've been discussing today at the Pentagon um, in your uh, national defence um, strategy. Um, there's a great deal around making sure that the operation works better. We do have some fairly um, uh, ineffective sort of kind of operational uh, and institutional structures which we need to sort of kind of clear up. Um, we need to get a better sense of the efficiency programs that we put in place at multiple times over the last 10 years or so. They become rather confused. Um, the uh, lexicon with which we describe them has become rather confused and we need to clear um, the campsite a bit there. Um, we need to have a different kind of relationship with industry. Clearly, we rely entirely on, well, not entirely, we rely a great deal on private industry, huge amounts of it in the States, quite a lot of it in Europe, and a vast amount of it in the UK. We've got into some sort of uncomfortable procurement practices. We've got into some uncomfortable relationship management practices, and I think that needs to be dealt with as well, just to make sure that we've got our house um, absolutely in order before we start thinking about some of the uh, big issues that we need to take, uh, with the big decisions we need to take around uh, capability. And uh, you know, just building a little bit on what Gordon uh, said, I mean, clearly we've got to take decisions about how much we're going to be investing in EW, in um, cyber, in directed energy weapons, in uh, information dominance. Um, these are very, very profound decisions mm -hmm. for us. They require us to certainly dial up some areas and probably to dial down some areas. CBRN, for instance, is very topical at the moment. How much should, should we be investing in CBRN? Um, we, need to, we need to go through that process of making sure that um, defence is in, uh, has got a good and sensible and solid, efficient, productive trajectory and then start making some of those decisions. And I, I should say one of, the, one of the real advantages of being over in Washington um, uh, today and for Gordon tomorrow um, is that we're not going to be optimising those decisions unless we listen to our most important allies um, within the context of alliances. So we have been asking those questions. What do you most mm -hmm. um, value in the UK? Where are we going to be bringing particular unique capabilities to bear um, for the benefit of all of us. And that is basically what we have been doing on modernizing defense and why we're in the process again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let's push that last point a bit, if you don't mind. Um, as you know, and as many people in the audience know, the Strategic Studies Department ran our international staff ride to Korea last week. And indeed, we had a student play Prime Minister Attlee because the United States and the United Kingdom go to war together a lot, it turns out, right? And one would expect that the United States expects 
things from the U United Kingdom and from your military to be able to deliver. Can you give us an understanding uh, and maybe respond to those skeptics who might say, well, given Brexit, given the budget situation, the UK won't have the capabilities. Some even say things like the United States should look to Australia instead, um, a country with which it has a close relationship but not a special relationship. Can you help us think a little bit about how this relationship can continue to be so tight in the defense sphere? Um, I um, am absolutely of the view that uh, the sorts of um, uh, rhetoric one gets about the, the, the depth and the breadth of the relationship between uh, US uh, defense community and UK defense community is so far beyond rhetoric. Uh, when you look at the amount of uh, technology collaboration, when you look at the relationship between our scientific communities in devising uh, the capabilities uh, of uh, the future, when you look at the uh, industrial uh, cooperation that uh, underpins both what we do now uh, and what we will do in the future. It is unsurpassed in its breadth and its uh, depth. Much of what we do is clearly held at a classification, which means that very few people fully and truly understand the breadth and the depth of that relationship. I can also tell you that it is by no means a one-way uh, relationship. It is a relationship to mutual benefit uh, because we are like-minded nations who see the world uh, in the same way. I'm absolutely not underplaying the very strong relationships that the US needs to have with many other like-minded, strong militaries around the world. Uh, but I can reassure you that the, as I said, the breadth and the depth of the collaboration in areas like cyber, in nuclear, in stealth technology, in sensor technology, in uh, missile technology is unparalleled. Thank you. Do you want to add, add to that? Or? Well, yeah, I'd obviously echo all of that. Um, I, I think I would also say that um, US colleagues are very clear about um, the ability and the will for uh, the UK to deploy and fight in contested uh, environments in a way that um, I w would ha hazard a guess is, un is unparalleled. Mm -hmm. And so there is a there is something about appetite here, um, which is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly have the appetite to play um, uh, the fullest possible role alongside friends in the global environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think that, that echoes where the US policymaking community would be, a real appreciation of and for what the UK military can bring. And post-Brexit vote, you know, there are just a lot of questions about sure. how that will manifest. And sure, sure. No doubt. You all have questions. There are questions here, um, of course. So let, let's then turn to the European theater. So EU, security force, NATO. How are you thinking about the UK's role in, in sort of an architecture that's getting a little bit complicated? Um, what makes sense for, for the UK? Um, as I said earlier on, I mean, we are not in the process of Brexit tying a massive lasso around the whole island and towing it out into the middle <laughs> of the Atlantic and repositioning it. I mean, we, we can't get over the fact that we are part of Europe. Um, our security uh, is intimately, indissolubly linked with the security of mainland Europe and theirs with ours. And it is absolutely um, critical uh, and this is something that European partners know, uh, that, you know, relationships, communications, data sharing, information sharing, capacity sharing, capability sharing, all of those things happen because otherwise the citizens of Europe are going to be less safe mm -hmm. and nobody wants that. Um, so I am entirely confident um, that the UK will continue to be, you know, a leading, one of the two or three leading players in European uh, security. I, I think that it would be um, disingenuous to pretend that there won't be some changes in European defence architecture. Um, I think if the UK gives up its seat at the EU table, then 
we clearly have less uh, of a say in trying to determine that. We would like to maintain as much of a say as we can, mm -hmm. and we are in discussions with European colleagues um, to do that, and I think on the whole um, that is something which is very much welcomed by them. We want to lean into this. Um, but it's not, nothing is going to get around the reality of NATO. Mm -hmm. NATO is what keeps Europe safe. Um, and, you know, we know that pretty much everybody else in Europe knows that. Um, certainly all of those uh, countries which are on uh, the northern um, and uh, 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 western borders of, um, uh, of Russia certainly know that. Mm -hmm. And that is not going to be given up, likely, or if, or indeed, sort of kind of ever. Particularly these days. Did you want to add to that? No, nope, that's, uh, that's covered it nicely. Perfect. So let me uh, just ask one more question, then I'll turn to the audience. So please begin brainstorming your questions. Um, if we could just spend, spend a moment deep diving on the nuclear front. And Gordon, you, you mentioned this a little bit. Um, the UK has a substantial um, uh, um, nuclear capability. It is one that is a 24-7 capability, the at-sea at deterrent. Um, as you know, the United States is also looking at its nuclear capability. The Nuclear Posture Review talked about not just um, continuing the triad, but also modernizing it. I think it's probably the first time in our contemporary history that we've had to both modernize our nuclear force and our conventional force which should worry anyone who thinks about defense budgeting numbers uh, a little bit. Um, can you help us think a little bit about how your nuclear capability will be maintained or grow in the future? Um, I assume it will continue to be integral to, to UK defense strategy. Can you tell us a little bit about so that? So I think it's, um, it's, it's the bedrock of um, UK defense uh, strategy. I mean, I think we need to review and refresh our idea of what deterrence is in this modern age, but we need to uh, build that upon the bedrock of our deterrent posture, which is the delivery of a 24-7 continuous uh, at-sea deterrent. Uh, I think that the, the two points I would make is, is firstly that it is a capability that we are uh, investing in, um, that uh, we have underway now the Dreadnought uh, programme, which is there to uh, replace our SSN, SSBN fleet to uh, assure and ensure the uh, continuation of that 24-7 capability. And that is supported by... Um, a great deal of investment in our SSN fleets, the, uh, the astute class, and indeed uh, more broadly with ASW capabilities that exist largely to protect uh, that capability. So it's an area of uh, huge uh, investment, it's an area of huge importance uh, to us, and it will continue to be, as I say, uh, the bedrock of our deterrent posture. The other point I'd make is just how closely uh, uh, and mutually supportive the US nuclear enterprises mm -hmm. to the UK uh, enterprise. We um, share um, a, a great deal um, in uh, the um, missile compartment, in, um, uh, in the missile itself, and in the sharing of information uh, and uh, knowledge in, in what is a really, really sort of complex uh, domain uh, that only a very small number mm -hmm. of nations um, are privy to. Indeed. Did you want to add to that at all? Um, you know, with the, as the money man, um, uh, your, your, your point is well made that it is, a, it is an enormous um, expenditure of national wealth, um, uh, both for your country and for our country. I mean, I think it is noticeable that when um, uh, Prime Minister Theresa May um, first took office, um, the first set-piece debate that she had was on the continuance of the deterrent. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but there are 650 um, MPs in the House of Commons, and the vote was something like, I don't know what it was, 612-4, and, you know, a few against. I mean, this is... This is as close to unanimous national main effort as you can make it, notwithstanding the fact that it is an enormous part of the defence budget and indeed an, uh, and a very large part of the national budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, governments have choices as to where they spend their uh, money. We have chosen to spend it on this absolutely 
foundational capability mm -hmm. um, and to surround it with all of the capability that we need to keep it safe and effective. Great, thank you. It's a, it's a useful description. So much of what happens, of course, between the United States and the United Kingdom, as you noted, General Messenger, is under the water, and uh, both, both literally and, and figuratively. And I think the images many people have of just working together in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, are, are imperfect and, mm. uh, and, and imprecise. And I best. think that's a really important point, and I'm glad to, to be able to make it. Absolutely, that's terrific. So now we'll turn to our students whose questions will generally be 10 times smarter and tougher than any of the professor's questions. Uh, so Catherine Olson has the microphone. If you can just raise your hand, uh, she'll, uh, she'll, she'll grab folks. Uh, thank you, I'm not a student. Uh, my name is Bill Courtney. I'm with the RAND Corporation. The United States has uh, pointed out that Russia is deploying a ground-launched cruise missile in contravention uh, to the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, the U.S. Congress has authorized work to uh, look into a U.S., a new U.S. ground-launched cruise missile. What do you think should be the appropriate NATO response, U.S. and U.K. response, uh, if Russia is not willing to remove the INF violation? Um, I think you're right to, 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 to mention NATO in, 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 in that context. Um, I think uh, that one of the things that uh, Russia uh, dislike the most are shows of international solidarity and strength uh, in response to what they have been uh, doing. Uh, and where there are flagrant uh, violations of existing treaties, then I think it's, um, uh, it's for NATO to decide uh, what to do about it, and it's for uh, member nations to uh, be supportive of that. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I don't want to spend the whole time thinking about how to control uh, Russian... Um, uh, activity in this session, um, but the pattern of behavior that um, we've been seeing, and you mentioned an important example of it, um, is one of um, attempting to ride roughshod over the kinds of um, proliferation agreements and conventions that have kept the world safe for the last 70 years. Um, and it is absolutely critical um, that the international community, which does not want to see that happen. And that includes, um, you know, countries such as China, in our view, um, uh, m makes it clear that that is unacceptable. So the contraventions of the Chemical Weapons Convention um, that we've seen in uh, Salisbury in the last couple of weeks are merely the latest example. And in my view, one of the most sort of kind of grotesque and extraordinary examples of that and I just want to put on the record um, the British peoples and the British governments um, thanks to the international community largely led by people over in this country in the firm response that um, has been uh, capable of being produced against that and that's the kind of uh, activity that's the kind of um, resolute um, opposition to that kind of activity that we need to see as much of as possible. And one should really be heartened, I think, actually, by the response uh, in recent days and weeks. Um, thank you. Let's get over uh, to this side. Hey, gentlemen, thank you. My name's uh, Khalil Fugit. I am a, a student. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just noting that, that very special and close relationship that you have with the U.S., I'm interested in your thoughts on some of the challenges in the in the in the in the near to medium term that you uh, you think may impact that relationship at all. Are you are you thinking about anything specific? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I think that we all face um, a challenge as to how we respond both nationally and internationally to this type of sort of steady state, uh, um, fragrant disregard for uh, what we have 
um, become used to being the rules-based international uh, system. Uh, and I don't think we have either nationally or collectively worked out what the rule book is for that. Um, I, I don't think we have yet nationally or internationally worked out uh, what are the sort of legal and the policy uh, implications of that to ensure that uh, we have sufficient flexibility uh, to act without undermining the, vi the values that are, are central to uh, how we uh, view uh, the world. Um, I am not suggesting for a second that there is any uh, friction um, between our relative national uh, positions on that, but I think it is as yet unfinished uh, business, un un incomplete uh, business, and I think um, we need to work together as collaboratively as possible to ensure that we do have a common set of, uh, of, of, of rules um, without undermining our common values. I personally think that that uh, uh, should be seen first and foremost as the role of our international organisations like the United Nations and, uh, and NATO uh, and others rather than um, bilateral arrangements. But clearly um, those conversations are going to continue. I mean, w w without wanting to come across as a sort of, kind of mail order marriage guidance counsellor, um, I mean, all, all, all relationships require, you know, continual investment. Um, uh, I don't think that there's any doubt, uh, you know, that the, the, the relationship between the UK and the US is very, very strong. People are talking at multiple levels in um, pretty much every sphere across um, uh, that the two enterprises. If that were to suddenly stop for some reason, I don't see why it should. If that was suddenly to stop, I think we would have an issue. I mean, uh, we changed, for instance, I'll give you an example. We changed the, um, the the structures by which we oversee and govern our nuclear enterprise about 15 months ago. We uh, decided it needed um, a slightly different type of approach in order to make sure that we uh, brought... Uh, the various capabilities that we've got together in a slightly more synchronized way. Um, it was pretty much as I joined the uh, department and uh, it was borne in on me as I'd spoke to my American colleagues about this. This is really, really very important to them how we did this. Um, you know, they, I, I went and told them about it because I like talking to people and telling them what we're doing anyway, but it, it became clear to me that actually if I hadn't done that, that would have been a big mistake. And we need to make sure that we understand why each other are doing things. Um, I'm sure we will. If that were to stop, then that would be a danger. Thank you. Here, let's get one up, uh, up here. Hi. So you talk about the need for Britain to remain at, at the forefront of defense technology, including against competitors that in some cases have um, weapons development programs better funded than those of the UK, but not as well funded as those of the United States or certainly NATO as a whole. So given that, can you talk to us about how you think about the balance between shared or joint R&D and defense industrial programs and, and local, unique uh, British defense industrial programs? I, th I think that's a, 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 a constant um, balance. I mean, firstly, um, I touched earlier on the fact that deterrence, our thinking on deterrence needs to evolve beyond simply um, the deterrent and, you know, in some way um, deterring the descent from peace into war. Um, it needs to much more uh, embrace um, the ability of a nation or a group of nations um, to hold a technical or some form of strategic edge or advantage over those that, that may be potential uh, adversaries. And if one has uh, access to those sorts of technologies or capabilities, uh, then one needs to uh, protect them um, because if you didn't do so, then um, you wouldn't be able to retain that strategic edge for very long. You then get into um, judgments as to whether it is uh, sensible um, to hold that nationally or whether it's sensible to hold that 
um, with a group of, 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 of nations that you, that you trust. You then get into debates as to whether, from in terms of the scientific base or the industrial base, you're more likely to be able to retain that technical advantage, doing so collaboratively or, or nationally. Uh, those are the sorts of debates that we have uh, that, 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 that we have all the time, and there's no one size fits all. But what I can tell you is the depth of um, uh, uh, collaboration on on a number of areas of that. I'm not sure I absolutely share your uh, characterization that, that other nations are investing uh, more um, than us. I mean, each, each nation has areas of potential technical advantage, and I think it's for us to exploit them to the fullest extent, either alone or with, uh, with, with allies. Yeah. I mean, Britain is the fifth biggest economy in the world. I think it spends more than, it was, I think it's the fifth biggest military spender in the world. I may have got those slightly wrong, but I don't think I have. Um, that's a, an extraordinary position of power to uh, come from. I mean, it's not as big as the United States, or not as big as China, but, um, but <laughs> I mean, the idea that we're sort of a lightweight in this, I think, is, um, is, is quite r wrong. I think we have a couple of, well, two, two other points. Um, one, if you were to compare us with Russia, which might be where you were sort of kind of thinking, they do have a range of um, uh, capabilities uh, that we need to be very careful um, of. They also have a range of weaknesses that we need to recognise as well. Let's not paint them as 10 foot tall. I mean, I was, uh, I was reminded the other day that, you know, they have their Admiral Kuznetsov, uh, which puffed its way billowing black smoke down the English Channel into the Mediterranean recently. Um, lots of its planes hit the drink, then it puffed its way back up again. It was meant to have a billion dollar refit and they couldn't find $500 million of that, so it only got a $500 million refit. So, um, you know, I know if that kind of thing had been happening in the UK military, I would have given, been given a very hard time by the, the relevant parliamentary committee. I suspect it probably doesn't quite happen like that in Russia, but, um, but I, might, I might be wrong. The, the other thing is that we have over, and Gordon, the, you know, eloquently described this, you know, unlike, for instance, Russia, we've got lots of friends. You know, we are part of the most important military alliance in the world, bar none. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the key member of which is the most important and capable military um, player in the world, bar none. Um, we have lots of bilateral alliances, and we may be coming out of the EU, but I said earlier on, there's absolutely no way we're coming out of European security cooperation. That is an amazing source of strength. Now, getting the balance right of where we invest and somebody else invests, and making sure that we're kind of exploiting comparative advantage within the alliance, of course, is, is, is something that you need to be thoughtful about, but it's a much better place to start than some other countries. Thank you. Uh, let's get the question over here. Uh, hi, my name is Atif. Um, so in terms of uh, Russia and how the U.S. would deal with them, Russia has a history of uh, pushing the envelope after um, sports events regarding uh, uh, that it's involved in. After it beat the Netherlands in the Euros, it uh, pushed into Abkhazia and South Ossetia. After Sochi, we know they went to the Crimea, and the World Cup is coming up. So what do you think, um, <laughs> it, apart from English fans going there and having a Euro 2014 repeat, um, what do you think would be the challenge for the US and the UK if they would push the envelope into Eastern Ukraine? And uh, second part, I don't know how much you can comment on it, but what's the plans for the uh, SAS in terms of um, advancement and deploying more considering the more threat-based system uh, world that we live in right now? Thanks. There's a paper to be written on correlation versus causation. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm unclear as to the sort of scientific evidence behind the, um, the Indeed, association with sports, <laughs> sporting events. And, uh, um, but we, 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 we and, 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 and of course NATO uh, as a whole are, are sort of very watchful of Russian posture um, uh, and um, monitor that very closely uh, to consider whether um, uh, something is, is, is likely to, to, to happen, uh, whether, whether there is a, a sporting event um, uh, or, or not. Um, in terms of... Um, our, our special forces, obviously, you, you wouldn't expect me to be anything other than uh, reasonably uh, tight-lipped, but um, 
for those people are as highly trained as uh, they are. Clearly, they have a role in um, the type of uh, 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 hybrid, uh, counter-hybrid um, activity that uh, we have seen uh, play out in various parts of Europe uh, and, and elsewhere. And we see that as an area where uh, we should be developing capabilities. Great. Thank you. Let's get over here uh, to Will. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the position of the, the two Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers in the defence modernisation programme. Um, there's been some questions about whether we can, Britain can really afford to purchase all the F-35s required to make them operational, or also if whether we can provide the battle group, the, the destroyers and supply ships to actually, at short notice, to defend them if we were to de deploy them. Considering the defence modernisation programme, and there is a small budget increase, I guess, but how can we really justify this when do you think, do you think the money should be spent elsewhere? Well, the F-35 programme um, does attract uh, increasing amounts of attention um, and it, it increases, it, it has a lot of attention over in the States um, and it's an, uh, attracting more and more attention in the UK as well and, and people do ask questions like uh, that. I, I should um, say that uh, the aircraft that we have contracted for so far, the first 48 of our 138, are well within budget, they are well within um, uh, uh, time, and um, everything I hear from uh, the people who actually operate them tells me that um, they have exceeded people's expectations of what they can do, and they are constantly finding more and more impressive uh, uses uh, for them. So. I, I, you, we are not um, uh, troubled at all by the F-35 programme. I think there is a perfectly legitimate journey of discovery which we are um, embarking on with uh, American colleagues about how do you operate these things, how do you sustain them. They are quite unlike any other fleet of aircraft that uh, we've, um, or America has, uh, has, has ever operated before. So, you know, you cannot be entirely sure what the answer to those, you know, operational and sustainment sort of kind of issues are. And it is certainly the case that we need to be very careful that um, we don't lose control of costs, or rather we, we operate them in the most cost-effective way so that they don't become a, a, a drain on that programme or any other programme. But that, wo that work is... It happening now and we're confident that we'll be able um, to get there. Um, the, the aircraft carriers are um, a, an absolutely critical element of um, uh, the ability of not just the UK but um, uh, countries with whom we share um, values and aspirations um, around things like freedom of navigation to be able to project those values and aspirations around the world in an incredibly visible and forceful kind of way. Um, our uh, deployment um, patterns and programs certainly accommodate being able to do that um, within British resources. If it turns out that the, uh, you know, the, the, the con concurrency picture means that some of those assets have to be sort of kind of dealt with elsewhere, we also have plans to be able to protect the asset um, with allies. So, I mean, it, these, are, these are deeply sort of kind of flexible and important um, uh, uh, assets for us and indeed for NATO um, and Europe and, and as I say, sort of kind of like-minded nations. So we're very proud um, to have them. We're hoping that you're looking forward to seeing them come over to the east coast um, of America sometime later in the year. September. 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 Great. L looking right. forward to it. When, when the sky goes black, you know they've arrived. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Can we um, can we come to the front? Thanks. Hi, uh, Leah Dreyfus. Um, I'm a student at SAIS. Uh, quick question: As you're undergoing this program, to what extent are you reevaluating the public and private sector relationship in this field in the UK? I'm thinking, especially in the context of a, a cybersecurity class, a number of us in the room are taking. Um, I know that the UK relationship between public and private sector in the cyber field in particular has had a very different history than that in the US. And so I'm wondering to what extent you're reevaluating, potentially changing it, and, and looking to collaborate with the private sector in different ways. So um, 
Shall I have a go at that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think um, the relationship between Please the pub- do. Yeah, the relationship <laughs> between the public and the private sector more broadly is 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 um, always one that is going to be governed to a certain extent by uh, our responsibility to spend taxpayer pounds as sensibly as we can. Um, and therefore, there are going to be the right levels of checks and balances in that. And there's going to be, uh, in order to assure value for money, some form of sort of uh, contractual um, a- a- arrangement. But we also need to recognise that uh, um, large sections of the private sector uh, um, uh, you know, can't function as effectively if there isn't a strong public sector, if there isn't a strong uh, defence and security uh, sector within uh, the United the United Kingdom. We also need to recognise that um, when one looks at the finite uh, 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 number of skills and the qu- quality workforce uh, that we have, that the private sector. Uh, is a source of that uh, skilled workforce, either as reservists or as some other form of leveraging national skills uh, in order to um, uh, support um, uh, you know, defence and security outputs. So we've got to get this balance right, I think, between a sort of more of a sort of teamwork and a partnership which recognises the mutual dependencies of the public and the private sector. I'm thinking particularly here about the defence sector, but actually, but actually I think you could broaden it to every sector of, of industry that requires a strong and stable uh, 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 home base and this challenge of ensuring that, that we need to be rigorous about how we invest and spend money. And trying to get that balance is, is difficult. I think that what we're doing as um, the challenges that we face broaden and, and deepen, we're moving more into that sort of partnership, uh, that partnership space um, without trying to compromise, obviously, the need to do that. On uh, cybersecurity, um, uh, we have established a cybersecurity centre um, that does a number of things, not least manages cyber incidents that affect the United Kingdom. But one of the key things it does is act as that one-stop shop for the private sector. It shares best practice, it gives advice, it holds to account, particularly those uh, critical national uh, elements of, of, of the private sector. And it's proved to be a really useful sort of uh, um, forum uh, for connecting the, 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 the two. I mean, it's going to be a crucible for the way in which we need to think about various bits of our defence might need to change in rather profound ways, I think. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a hackathon which was organised, I think, by DSGL a year or so ago, and the, uh, the aim was to get into sort of a military um, uh, network set up somewhere else, and the winner of it was, a, I think, a 14-year-old guy from a uh, South Asian background who I think it would be fair to say would not have been the most obvious candidate for traditional military recruiting in the UK. Um, but um, we, uh, n- we need to have people like that young man and um, you know, young women who are going to be capable of doing these things to think about um, a career in defence to be able to do the things that we need to do. And Britain starts in a great place to be able to do that because we have some amazing capabilities. I mean, really do. We have some absolutely world-leading capabilities in this, in this area. But um, I think getting, sh- making sure that the leading lights of it are, you know, focusing on, on, on defence is going to be, is going to be difficult for us. And it's going to be something that we're going to have to really Um, concentrate on and we may have to think about different types of careers we may have to think about how we use the reserves more sensibly there's lots of quite profound things in the cyber domain which I think will probably then yeah Yeah. will bleed it will bleed over to the rest of um, the rest of the defense uh, enterprise as well it's a dilemma the US military is also facing right how do you get these non-traditional folks in the last administration tried it in the US with force of the future how do you maintain a professional military when you've changed the pathways a bit? How do you get that 14-year-old to say, actually, this is a thing I want to do for a yeah. bit? Indeed. Uh, thank you. There was a question over here. Jacob. Hi. Jacob Cohen. I used to be a student here and 
now I do various other things. Um, but I have a question <laughs> of strategy and resources. So the more I hear about a post-Brexit Britain, the more I hear about a global Britain, and it seems as if there are more expansive ambitions or a more expansive concept of what Britain should be doing. And that costs money. Um, so I'm curious, is that impression that there is a more expansive vision for British defense policy going to move in line with increased resources, or is that impression incorrect and there's not, you're not sort of moving towards a strategy of resource mismatch? Well, I mean, we're going through um, the program, the, uh, the modernizing defense program at the moment, and of course, uh, the backdrop of, of it is Brexit. Um, of course, the UK's position in the world will change. I mean, that's, that, that, is, that, that, that is self-evident. And um, as we um, work through particularly that fourth package of what the capabilities we will want to have are, we are going to be thinking, the Prime Minister particularly and senior Cabinet colleagues, will want to be thinking about the kind of um, posture that the UK adopts for um, the future. I think it is absolutely unavoidable that the UK will want to be more um, out there in the world. That is not purely a matter of um, resources. That, uh, in some senses, is actually a, a, a matter of, of will and appetite to do that. Um, and I think that you will see an increased will and appetite uh, to do it. It is also not merely a question of increased resources. It may well be using your existing resources more effectively so they can be deployed more often. Those are the kinds of things that we will be thinking about. But I don't, I don't um, at all um, uh, want to um, deny your central assertion that Brexit will mean a different kind of um, a positioning for the for Britain in the world, and that will have an effect on the kinds of decisions that we have to make and ministers have to make over the next few months. Yeah, let's take one around this side. Thank you. Uh, Alice Penny, I'm assistant professor here at SAIS. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time. I have two quick questions. I don't think I've heard you mention the Sahel region. Uh, how much of a priority is it for the British uh, military today? And the second question is, um, uh, Mr. Lovegrove, you mentioned, uh, I quote, uncomfortable procurement practices and the need to reform um, the MOD procurement practices. And can you specify what you meant by those um, uncomfortable procurement practices that need to be reformed? Sure. Well, do, do you want to talk about Sahel and then I'll... Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, it goes back to the point about European security uh, matters um, as, uh, as 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 much to us in a sort of post-Brexit world as it, as it as it ever did, and there's no doubt that the Sahel is a source of uh, instability both within the region itself and um, and uh, uh, to a lesser degree, frankly, um, uh, into uh, Europe. So we're uh, hugely supportive of. Uh, the United Nations, the EU, and the French-led uh, efforts in that area. And indeed, you'll have seen that we have committed heavy lift helicopters uh, into that region in support of uh, all three missions, and including the G5 Sahel as a fourth uh, mission, uh, in order to demonstrate our commitment to make that, and, and make that mission more uh, effective. Um, we um, uh, currently, our priority countries in Africa are Somalia and uh, Nigeria, and with South Sudan as a third under the United Nations banner, we think that that's right. Uh, we think that those nations demand, uh, require uh, the level of sort of investment and support that we as a uh, as a nation can give, and we think that that's um, sensible uh, division of responsibility between us and the French-led effort in uh, in the Sahel. So, in, in terms of uh, acquisition, um, I think I would say uh, two or I would highlight two or three things. Um, one is we have um, a number of different acquisition organisations, um, and we need to make sure that they are. Um, adhering to the same sets of um, central uh, practices, guidelines, standards, so that we can tr try and drive inefficiency out of the system. Um, we spend, for instance, a huge amount of money on our information and networks business. Um, and I think that one of the 
focuses that Gordon and I will have for the future will be to try and make sure that we are spending the right amount of senior time looking at that because I suspect it, it, we probably we may not be doing at the moment. Um, the, the other thing I think that we need to um, evolve is a capability that we uniquely have in the United Kingdom called the um, single source uh, regulations. Uh, about 50% of um, our acquisitions are actually made um, in a non-competitive environment um, because uh, there's only one there's only one buyer usually and there's well always um, and there's only one seller and that leads to I mean you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winning economist to know that that is um, you know, that can lead to sort of some suboptimal outcomes for both sides, as a matter of fact, um, in, in a lot of in instances. So uh, three or four years ago, um, the UK um, established uh, single source regulations and the single source uh, regulatory office to oversee um, and um, a judge on disputes in that kind of non-competitive environment. Um, that is a, an organization which um, we're very proud of. Um, lots of other countries have come to us and talked about its operation. And my response has been, we are, we are very proud of it. We think that it's, we can't believe, if we didn't have it now, we would have to invent it tomorrow. Does it have further to go in terms of how um, active it can be in making sure that the taxpayer gets the um, the, the right equipment at the right price, yes, it certainly does. So there's going to be a continual evolution of that part of the landscape as well. So we're nearly out of time. Uh, I'd ask you both to just offer a final comment or two, but I will throw out a question as you think about that. Um, it has been a real treat having you here and hearing your thoughts over the last hour. I'd like that we introduce, that we bring you back in about three years, in 2021. And when that happens, what are you going to say that the UK has gotten wrong over these three years? I really hate questions like that. <laughs> well, first of all, three years' time, I'm aiming, I'm aiming to be sitting down there and saying, my name's Stephen Lovegrove, I'm a mature student. Uh, we uh, would welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> what will we have got wrong? What are the things that we're most l likely to have got wrong might be the way... I think, I think there's, any, there's any number of things that we can get wrong. <laughs> um, That's the problem with the question. There's I too much. I can absolutely it. guarantee you that. I mean, one of the um, one of one of the, uh, the, the the challenges of sitting where sort of we do over a you know a defence uh, community of the size of ours is is just simply the complexity mm -hmm. and the interrelated nature of of it, and the idea that um, you know single people can put their arms around the totality of what goes on, the understand the first, second and third order effects of doing something in one part of the system on the rest of the system, you know, forget. Um, so what we do is we tend to um, uh, deal with pop-up problems um, because they're the things that you can grasp and you can focus on and you know they need to be solved so you're not doing anything wrong. Um, uh, what I hope that we are able to do is, is adopt a slightly more sort of transformative uh, approach to it. I personally think that the nature of operations in the future uh, uh, and the demands of the future, you know, require a more transformative approach. I think um, that we need to, um, you know, really embrace the sort of information age and the point that Stephen made about uh, the achievement of information advantage starts to become the battle winning, the conflict winning uh, uh, issue above those more sort of conventional mm -hmm. contests that, that um, uh, uh, were decisive in previous campaigns. Um, I think that the biggest risk that we have and therefore the thing that we're most likely to get wrong is their inability to provide the rightly skilled uh, quality workforce to deliver that. Mm -hmm. um, because um, that's what it needs is, is good quality skilled uh, people uh, and they're in uh, short supply, the demographics are against us and unless we do something really quite profoundly different then I think we'll be um, uh, playing catch up. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll offer one thing uh, which m might go wrong, which I'm, you know, determined to do absolutely everything in my power to n not make it go wrong. Is that we do have this concept of um, 
strategic affordability, the idea that um, uh, we um, enter into um, commitments about the shape of our forces, which actually we then find difficult to fund or difficult to fund on the right profile is one that I think bef besets every single defense establishment in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we are n no exception to that. I mean, the UK has made mistakes in that in the past. I'd be really, really keen to um, drive into it, into what we're doing at the moment, a sense of strategic affordability, a sense of r r realism and, uh, and grip, which um, will uh, allow for predictable planning, which I think is, 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 is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what the MDP is about. I hope we don't get that wrong. What we will not have got wrong um, is um, investing time in our international relationships um, and our alliances and um, trying to understand where others have come from and trying to be open and talk about where we want to be as the UK. I have absolutely no doubt, to go back to the gentleman over there, question that we will um, continue to do that. Um, uh, we won't be complacent about it, um, but opportunities like this are part of it, and I thank you very much indeed for giving it to us. Indeed. Well, please join me in thanking our distinguished guests for being so generous with their time and insights. Thank you. Thank you.